everyone, and welcome to another episode of Seed Speaks. My name is Alex Martin, and I am the editor of Seed World Magazine, and today I'm absolutely thrilled to be your host. Last week, you learned all about the ins and outs and new technologies happening in the world of irrigation, and this week, we're kind of turning into a different direction. We're looking into how to get your fields off to the right start by ensuring seed health with the, the best thing to ensure seed health, seed testing. To help us learn a little bit more, we've got two fantastic jo panelists joining us today. Please welcome Amanda Patan, uh, who is the key account manager of SGS, and Trevor Blois, who is supervisor of the disease department at 2020 Seed Labs. Um, Amanda, Trevor, thank you so much, both of you, to um, for joining us. It's so exciting to have two seed testing experts here with us today. Um, before we dive into our questions, I'd like to get to, uh, down with it with some uh, introductions. So Amanda, I'll start with you. I'd love to hear a little bit more about yourself and SGS if you wouldn't mind sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm excited to be here today to talk about seed quality. I have been seed testing for 22 years. Uh, started out with um, doing method development in the research department, did that for about 17 years, and then switched to key count management. Uh, with that, I have um, really enjoyed my aspects with educating people and talking about what seed testing is all about. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. Trevor, I'll pose the same question to you. Tell us a little bit more about yourself in 2020 Seed Labs. Sure. So my name is Trevor Blois and I am the disease super or the supervisor of the disease department here at 2020 Seed Labs. Um, I started working here at 2020 in uh, 2010. So I've been here for 12 years, uh, not quite as long as Amanda, but I'm working on it every every year is another year. So um, and I started working here right after graduating from the University of Alberta. Um, and uh, 2020 Seed Labs uh, ha was established back in 1989. So it's a little bit older than I've been working here too. Um, and to this day, it's still independently owned and operated. Um, and we provide services for everybody in the industry, growers, uh, farmers, uh, seed production and seed protection companies, uh, research organizations, and even some non-agricultural industries too. Uh, we hold full accreditation from uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for all crop kinds. Uh, we're also accredited uh, by the International Seed Testing Association. We have locations in Miscu, Alberta, and that's where I work, um, just south of Edmonton. Um, we've got a location out in Manitoba, uh, just south of Winnipeg there. Um, and then we also have a location down in Chile, too, where we do um, some testing uh, during their production season as well. Um, and uh, I'm really happy to be here and looking forward to our discussion today. Thanks so much, Trevor. Okay, well, I guess with that, let's dive into some more technical questions. Amanda, I like to start on the broad side of questions. So let's just start broad, easy, and kind of ease into this uh, topic. Can you tell me why is seed testing important and why should it matter to seed companies in the long run? Okay, so seed testing in general uh, is important to assess your seed quality, including traditional testing as well as vigor and mechanical and, of course, seed health. Uh, it helps minimize the risk, uh, determine quality issues, um, look at, at variety attributes and identify potential problems for client complaints and to also look at seed lot specifics um, and difficulties as well as the seed lot strengths. Uh, with that too, you're looking at producing high quality seed and you wanna make sure that it's free of disease, free of weeds, looking at the purity of noxious, looking for a strong germination, a vigor that allows companies to have maybe a competitive edge. Um, also, you're looking at the composition of your seed. For example, if you're breeding seed for a specific product, you wanna look at the proteins, the oil contents, the starches, uh, and look at the genetics and where it puts uh, the value into your market itself. So as you're looking at seed, you want to look at everything that you do to it to get to your end product. So you want to uh, look at your seed quality because it helps determine your stand, 
your yield, and then of course your total value of your seed crop. So with that, um, it's important also for the last little aspect that I feel is an important, very important aspect, which is meeting your regulations for your country. So for the Federal Seed Act, um, for state laws, for, for country laws, and then if you're importing or exporting internationally, then you're looking at international laws and uh, seed movement. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. And I know we're going to, I have a question for both you and Trevor later to, to talk a little bit more about seed laws, seed requirements and things of the like. But before we get there, um, Trevor, uh, Amanda just gave us a great outlook on, on seed testing, but what, do you, what are some things you typically diagnose when you're, when you're testing seed? Um, what should seed companies be on the lookout for? Right, right. So when we're doing, you know, those normal quality tests like German Vigor, um, some of the things that we can diagnose are problems such as uh, like mechanical or chemical damage, um, as well as like frost or, you know, small seeds or dormancy. Uh, those are all things that show up um, during those tests uh, that we can, we can determine our problem. Um, you know, what I do at the lab here is uh, doing disease testing, right? So uh, the things that we're looking for, the big one really is Fusarium graminearum in cereals um, in the prairies in Canada here. Um, with, uh, with pulses, we're looking at Ascochyta. Uh, with canola, we're looking at black leg. So usually with, you know, most of the crops, we're looking at one big pathogen, but in any given year, you know, there can be another pathogen that's a, that's a problem too. So we're also looking at uh, trends um, from year to year, um, whether or not there's uh, some sort of uh, issue that's emerging as the as uh, you know our testing season progresses, um, and whether or not we need to let growers or seed production companies know that there's some sort of problem with uh, the seed lots that uh, we're testing, um, and you know these problems are really highly dependent on the growing conditions in a given year. So we'll uh, we'll. Um, you know, it, it won't be too much of a surprise usually often um, because it is, you know, a result of those uh, growing condition problems that we're seeing. Um, and then, you know, as we're, as the year goes on too, we're looking for uh, new weeds that might be showing up in purity tests. Um, we're looking for new pathogens that we haven't seen before, um, as well as uh, one big thing that we do here at 2020 is uh, kind of look at, um, where, uh, you know, geographically uh, diseases are present um, and kind of tracking the spread of those. So uh, it's important to, you know, be looking out for new areas where uh, weeds or pathogens are emerging that haven't been present before. So those are kind of the things that we're looking for when we're, when we're doing the testing. Yeah, thanks so much, Trevor. I'm glad you mentioned that it, it it's kind of a good benchmark to also see how the, the year is going as well agronomically because Sounds like that that is a very important aspect and it's important to our customers as well. Now, I, I mentioned we would come back to talk about uh, seed test requirements. So um, I, I'm gonna start with Trevor just since he was the one who left us off, but I know there are plenty of different tests and it might be, there might be different tests that are required in different areas. Um, Trevor, what are some of the requirements you see in Canada? Do you see different requirements across um, provinces as well right right so um in canada um the the uh, requirements are set out in the grade tables that are provided by the canadian food inspection agency um so that uh, includes uh the the standards for germination and purity um the one additional thing that's uh, that's present on the grade tables is uh, true loose smut and barley. Uh, so that's the one uh, disease test uh, that we have that is um, accredited by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Um, and so those are the, the standards that are kind of the, the minimum standards for pedigreed seed production in Canada. Um, that being said, different clients have, you know, some requirements that are above and beyond those. Um, and so, you know, we, we might be testing uh, a big instance is vigor, right? So 
Um, vigor isn't included on those uh, grade tables, um, but seed production companies can have uh, their own uh, vigor requirements. Um, another thing is herbicide resistance. You know, they have to make sure that a high enough percentage of their seed is uh, resistant to the herbicide so that, you know, you get out there and you spray and it's not all, all killed. Um, as well as um, with canola blackleg. Um, so they test their uh, the canola seed to ensure that there's no black leg present because you don't want that to show up and be a surprise. So uh, those are those are the um, the requirements in Canada, um, and uh, it's it's not different from province to province either. Unlike what Amanda will go through with, it could be different in the states. I'm not too sure. <laughs> You gave you gave us a perfect segue. Amanda, what do you see in terms of seed testing required for the U.S.? And it's I think it's a very valid question. Does it differ from state to state? Because I know different states can have different regulations. Right, right. It does. It, it varies from state to state. And it also depends, of course, on your species that you're looking at. Uh, so with we we at SGS uh, routinely uh, perform what's required for the Federal Seed Act label law, uh, which is following the AOSA rules. We also do ISTA rule testing as well as Canadian MMP and look at the grade tables as well. Uh, with that, in the U U.S., we have to provide what is required for the label. And like Trevor said, uh, a lot of clients go above and beyond that to test the quality of the seed, to look at vigor, to look at their trait tolerances, to look at uh, the genetics aspect as, as including the herbicide bioassays as well. So we're looking at germination, which is uh, on the label. We're looking at purity noxious, which is on the label, and then percent um, of, of mixtures if it is a mixture crop. Uh, or, or label. Uh, in things like rice, we're looking at rice blast. Uh, we're looking for noxious weeds. The noxious weeds that we're looking for, we're following the noxious weed. Each state has different requirements. So we'll do a new U.S. noxious, which will be for the whole United States, or we'll do the state-specific noxious because there's different requirements for different states. And as you're looking also at, at um, the pathogens that are present, uh, different state and areas have different requirements based on where the seed itself was grown, so the origin of the seed. Um, so it really depends on where you're planning on sending the crop when you're looking at what's required for that state label. Uh, you can't have certain things like amaranth uh, in is a weed seed, uh, and so some states have uh, taken the whole entire amaranth species off, so that's an noxious weed if you for all of the species, which is kind of um, contradictory because it is a crop too in some areas. So then in another state, you have just uh, amaranth palmarami, uh, amaranthus palmari. And so as we're looking at that as being the noxious weed, then we go to DNA testing to specify whether or not it is that species, specific species. Yeah, very fair. It sounds like there's a lot of preparation that, that you need to to be prepared for when you're when you're going into seed testing. So thank you both so much for sharing that. It is a lot to do in the United States, it sounds like. Um, speaking of, of planning and preparation, I set these questions up pretty, pretty well this week. Um, Trevor, can you help um, us kind of see what, what seed testing can help us do in the field every year? How can seed testing help you make those? Um, I think we've mentioned it kind of gives you a benchmark to look at throughout the year. So can seed testing help you make adjustments in the field agronomically? Or is there more preparation you need to do in the, prep in the planning portion of the year this year? Right. So you know, once once you planted the seed and it's growing, uh, you've already made that decision about <laughs> what seed to use, um, and you have the information from your seed testing to kind of um, know know how it's uh, uh, going to uh, progress. Hopefully, um, but uh, during the growing season, really, you're kind of limited. Um, you know, if in uh, with disease testing, um, there are foliar pathogens that we can detect um, in cereals like uh, Pyronophora or Septoria um, or Ascochyta impulses. Um, and if you had a high level of those on your seed test, um, you know, that might give you a heads up to, 
you know, be really vigilant with scouting, um, looking out for those pathogens uh, during the growing season. And, uh, you know, you might be more prepared to apply a foliar fungicide if it's necessary. Um, during the growing season, we do offer a service um, called the Spornado, where growers put out a passive spore trap out into their fields, um, and, and the spores get caught onto a little cassette, um, and then they send that cassette into the into the lab here, and we test it for uh, for DNA for uh, pathogens of interest, so um, Fusarium graminearum in cereals, um, Sclerotinia and canola, and like. Blight, late blight in uh, potatoes are the pathogens that we currently test for uh, during that. Um, during the planning part of the year, um, you know, that's when you can really uh, narrow down which seed lots you want to use, um, you know, which which is below your standards, whatever, whatever standards you're following. Um, and really those, those results, the, if you take the germination bigger in thousand kernel weight, um, you can use those to help calculate your optimum seeding, uh, rate. Um, you know, you can also do disease testing and that will help you, uh, determine which seed treatments are, uh, going to be most effective. Um, and, uh, and, you know, by taking all of the, your, your results into, um, into, uh, calculation, you're you're able to make those decisions much better um, for the planting uh, season. Perfect. Thanks so much, um, Amanda. I know there part of one of the important aspects that that goes into seed testing starts with creating an adequate or gathering an adequate sample. I should say. Um, what is your advice for ensuring you're getting a good seed sample to send to be tested? Well, I, I, I teach the ISTA sampling workshop here at SGS uh, that we provide. So that's a day and a half course um, if you want to talk about it for a long time. But just quickly, um, making sure you're getting an unbiased and representative sample of your entire seed lot, entire seed lot. Um, AOSCA, which is the U.S. rules uh, or handbook uh, for seed sampling, uh, is an excellent resource uh, to be followed. Uh, we also have um, sampling uh, rules in the AOSA seed testing handbook, and then of course ISTA uh, sampling rules. The um, main things you need to look for are making sure you're using the proper sampling equipment, that your equipment is clean before using it, uh, that you are getting the representative sample from throughout the seed lot and that you're sampling enough areas throughout the seed lot. And there's tables that you can base that on uh, based on the size of your lot and what containers those samples are in. So a lot of times people use a trier that is a vertical uh, sampling into large bin boxes and say there are a thousand uh, uh, kilograms uh, and those samples themselves when you're, when you're sampling with that, you have to make sure that you're using a partition probe so that you're not just sampling one portion of that seed box as it's falling down without the partitions in it. So you got to make sure you have your partition probe. Uh, so having your, tra your samplers trained adequately, and then especially if you're doing disease testing, making sure you're cleaning your probes, not only for just the seeds themselves, but any of the potential spores or pathogens that would be present, virus, bacteria. And when you're doing a um, national seed health test in the U.S. where you're looking for your visual inspection there, you're going to be looking for the contaminants in there, which includes insects, insect parts, uh, rodent droppings, uh, soil, all of those things. So you want to make sure your probe is very clean and that you're using the proper uh, sanitation devices as well. Thanks so much, Amanda. We'll have to revisit you one time. So that way, maybe you can give us the entire course of, of getting an adequate seed sample. But until then, Trevor, I, I know there are also some things in the testing field that, that can kind of go wrong if you don't get that adequate sample. So what, what are some examples of things that can, can go south quickly if you don't have an adequate sample? Like, is there certain possibilities of missing certain disease or quality aspects? Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. And that's why, you know, sampling is so important. And that's why there are, you know, the ISTA uh, courses for doing that. Um, and um, when, when it comes down to it, 
for the disease testing, we're testing only uh, 200 seeds out of an entire seed lot. Um, for most, most of the disease tests, it's 200 seeds. Um, you know, we can increase that amount um, if it's requested um, or if there's a certain pathogen that, you know, has a lower requirement because 200 can only detect down to 0.5%. So um, some things like um, uh, ascochyta in chickpeas, um, that could be, um, cause even more damage, um, you know, down to any presence less than 0.33%. Uh, so you want to detect or you want to test uh, even more seeds for that. Um, but uh, when you think about disease too and how it um, often presents in, in, a, in a crop, um, quite often it can be spatially located in different uh, parts of the field, right? So um, when you're harvesting uh, that, if, um, if uh, you know, your, uh, say, say the disease is um, more located on the east part of the field. Um, and uh, so all the seeds that are harvested in that half are going to have more uh, disease present. So if you're only testing from, uh, you know, the one part of the bin or the track, then um, you're, you're not going to get a good representation of the entire seed lot as a whole. So um, it's, it's always good to test uh, more samples. Um, and uh, test multiple times throughout the growing season as well, um, because uh, with diseases too, we can see um, can see that changing um, year to year for sure. But even within a growing season, we see disease levels uh, changing. Um, so it's it's very important for um, to do uh, adequate sampling um, as well as uh, testing enough seed. I would say from from a seed lot. Perfect. Thanks so much, Trevor. Um, I am looking at our time and we're starting to run a little bit low on time. So I'm going to squeeze in hopefully two more questions. So I have another question that I think will be good for both of you. You've both mentioned um, through, throughout this conversation a couple of different things to look out for in, in certain crops. And I'm sure it's based on location and things like that. But what are typically the biggest culprits that people need to be on the lookout for? Um, and ready to test for in a given year um, in terms of disease, maybe pests, things like that. Um, Trevor, I'll start with you. And then Amanda, we can have you add on um, because I know regionally there's there's going to be different uh, crops that you see too. Yeah, so, um, you know, it, it does vary uh, depending on your location, certainly. Um, in the Canadian prairies, we, we definitely focus on those pathogens that I mentioned earlier. Um, Fusarium graminearum in cereals, Ascochyta in pulses, um, blackleg in canola that can be seed borne. Um, and these are all really highly dependent on the precipitation that's observed through the growing season. Um, and so, you know, not only do you have that geographical difference, but you have the geographical difference of the precipitation too, right? So this year we had um, a really wet spring in Manitoba, um, whereas, you know, the rest of the growing season or the rest of the prairies were relatively um, average or a little bit below average as far as the precipitation goes. Um, so for this year, we're actually seeing in the testing that we've been doing this uh, that from this harvest, it's still really early on, but we've been seeing, um, you know, on the lower side of disease levels present in seed compared to uh, some previous years that have been a lot wetter. Um, you know, we're still waiting a lot on a lot more samples coming in from Manitoba. So um, because they had that wet spring, they planted a lot later. And uh, so the, they're, they have a much more delayed harvest. So uh, they have a traditionally higher uh, disease pressure out there. So I'm expecting it to be a little bit higher out there. Um, you know, those those are um, the kind of things that we're uh, on the lookout for. Um, there, there's other pathogens that can be present um, that that are a big concern, but um, these are the ones that are the the seed uh, seed borne diseases that that we really focus on. Thanks so much. Um, Amanda, again, I know we see different crops in the U.S. here. Corn and soybean are king of the row crops. So what do you see in terms of disease pressure in the U.S.? So this, I would say the same issues. It, moisture is huge. When that moisture comes is also really important. If it happens during flowering, a lot of times you'll have an increase of, say, fusarium or increases in Stuart's wilt. Uh, in corn. And then for, of course, soybeans, it's at harvest time uh, when you're doing the weathering, uh, when the phobopsis sets in, and you're going to see a lot of different fungal attacks at that point. 
So we're looking at agronomic factors for the growth of the pathogen. A lot of the ideal conditions for seed growth are the same ideal conditions as for the pathogen's growth. So as in looking at it ergonomically, of course, the moisture percent, you're going to be wanting to look for vectors for disease and, and bacteria. So um, insect pressures, uh, and then of course, your crop conditions too, through the growing seeds season, uh, weeds within your field itself, because while um, seed health is is um, really equivalent to the crop itself, what weeds are in there too can promote uh, other pathogens to entering into the field and of course contamination for um, uh, sending to other states or internationally. And then what chemicals are applied that can also affect uh, and when they're applied can also affect that outcome of seed health. Um, but what we are seeing this year so far is very similar, uh, lower moisture at this time of year than we had uh, last, well, two years ago. Last year we had low moisture. So then we start to think about, okay, uh, instead of disease, are we looking at mechanical damage uh, potential? Um, of course, all of the uh, international um, uh, needed testing that happens in corn. There's quite a few of them for all the different countries that are out there. Um, and then from state to state, we don't want to spread diseases that are present in one re region into another region. So we look for those vectors and we look for um, signs of moisture as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, both of you. And I have one last question for you in the last three minutes that we have. And this might be a silly question, but I think it's going to be, it's going to hit our whole topic home today. Um, Amanda, I'm going to start with you. How can starting with healthy seed really increase success in your field agronomically? Well, not only starting with healthy seed, uh, so we're looking at disease free. So if you're screening for uh, specific pathogens that are seed borne first and using that as your uh, quality standard, using the quality standard where you're looking at um, your germination and vigor uh, ratings because the stress on the seed also affects the um, amount of pathogen that will interfere. It's just like us. If we have a cold, um, we're more prone to have a bacterial infection take over. Uh, so if you don't have that vigor and vitality uh, as a, a qual high quality seed unit, you're going to be more prone to disease. Also, you look for disease resistance uh, varieties too, if you're looking at the genetics aspect as, as well as that vigor aspect. So starting out with those uh, factors for your seed, as well as thinking about where you're planting it too, making sure that your, your field itself is free of that disease. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amanda. Trevor, is there anything you'd like to add? Why, why do we need to start with healthy seed to increase our success agronomically in the field? Yeah, that, that was really well said by Amanda. <laughs> um, really, um, you know, uh, healthy seed is, um, you know, your your number one uh, most important crop input, I would say, you know, if you, if you don't have a healthy seed, you're not going to have a healthy crop, right? Um, and so by testing seed and using a good quality seed, um, you know, you can ensure that you get started off on the right foot. Um, and one of the big things is having a good high vigor will help ensure that you have a uniform emergence throughout the field. Um, and so this will help with having uh, the same maturity level, you know, throughout the growing season um, so that you have a good uh, crop canopy that will help, you know, to, to control weeds throughout the field um, so that, uh, you know, you're able to uh, plan your spraying for different products throughout the growing season so that it's all uniform. Um, and even, you know, months later during harvest, when you're, uh, when you're harvesting, you know, right now we're doing it, um, that uh, everything is at the same maturity level and ready to be harvested at the same time. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's why seed testing is, um, is so important and using good quality seed uh, every year. Perfect. Thanks so much, Trevor. Well, that is all the time we have today. We got done right on time. Um, thank you so much, Trevor and Amanda, to both of you for joining us today. I know I've learned a lot more about seed testing than I, I probably should have known in the first place, but hopefully everyone in our audience who got to watch today took some home, uh, took home some fun information as well.
Um, if you liked this topic, make sure to tune in next week. My coworker, Allie Roden, is going to be helping us learn a little bit more about soil sampling and soil health. So we're kind of maintaining the same topic of starting out fresh for the year. So um, look forward to that then, and we'll see you all then. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.